Okay, guys, good morning. Welcome back again. Um, here we are, and it's Wednesday, March 31st, and we've got about five or six minutes till we get the 9 a.m. class started. But I hope you guys are doing very well and having a good week and semester as we get back into this kind of changed format. Um, yeah, so good to be with you guys. Feel free to say hi or anything while we're here at any time, as usual. <clears throat> Hey, Connor, good to see you. Good morning. <clears throat> and hey there, Grant, good to see you. <clears throat> I wonder, are you guys having other classes in your schedule that are returning to the in-person format or yeah, I don't, I don't know at all um, what most professors have done. I mean, I'm basically just receiving guidance from the university that this is our policy, but I just don't know what other students are experiencing in their case. It might be interesting to know. Hi, Nina. Hi, Abby. Good to see you guys. <clears throat> yeah, well, I mean, it's not like a distinction that I'm trying to achieve. Um, because I think I've made it clear before that it would not have been my preference overall. But um, I'm just trying to respond to student uh, preferences and stuff. In this, in this class, we haven't seen anybody show up yet. But I heard that they're going to the um, orange tier or whatever starting today in Orange County. So that gives them the authority to add more capacity to some of these rooms. Anyway, yeah. I'm getting my second in, uh, dose of the vaccine on Saturday, and then I have even less concerns about it myself. Hey, Sloan, Stephen, good to see you guys there. <clears throat> so, um, Okay, yeah, Connor, I, I mentioned this in a message, but it, it's easy to overlook, but the cl our class is at um, Argerios Forum, room 208. And um, yeah, so Argerios Forum, second floor, room 208, that's the classroom. <clears throat> it's a pretty big classroom. It would definitely be, I think, capable of holding some students if they did want to come with all the space that I'm looking at, but um, yeah. Hi, Dimitri. So, I mean, it's, I'm neither, uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to remain neutral on what I'm, you know, suggesting. I'm not really trying to suggest anything, but it's possible for some students to, to come to class if they do want. Um, probably most students don't prefer to, but I know that some indicated an interest in it. And if those students do still have those feelings, it's fine to come. Uh, and if others want to try and check it out just to get a little bit of a your feet wet to see how it's going to be in the fall. I mean, provided that you feel safe or if you have some kind of vaccination status or whatever, you know, precautions you're willing to take. But, but yeah, um, we could hold some students in here if they wanted to come. But I'm not trying to, like, necessarily advocate for it. It's just an option. And, yeah, that's right, Ryan. They've Today, as of today, we're in the orange tier. So it moves from 25 to 50 percent um, room capacity. Hi, Ch Chase, Eloise, Kylie, everybody here, Amanda, <clears throat> welcome back. <clears throat> it's definitely, it's, it's like, um, I mean, I don't know if you guys have gone to campus, whether you, I mean, most of you, I guess, haven't been returned to classes, but if you've even visited campus, it's it's a little eerie, right? It's like a ghost town. It's kind of like walking around um, in just an empty campus. Well, you're in the buildings, you're in the classrooms, but it's just nobody's there. Um, it's totally a weird feeling, <clears throat> but it's all right. Okay, cool, and hi, Brian, welcome back. Just another minute or so, and then we'll get things started for today. <clears throat> so 
Hi, Finn, Nicole. Welcome, everyone. And Ellie. <clears throat> Julia, good morning. Okay, guys, and hi, Drew, good to see you too. So welcome back, everyone. It's uh, pretty much class time, so I'm gonna let things get started. Um, welcome back as usual. So it's um, once again here at Chapman in Argerios Forum, room 208, all by myself. Um, like you guys know, and it, uh, we've, we've talked about before, um, classes, for me anyway, have moved to the classrooms on campus. And if there's any students interested in trying to attend for any reason, um, you're free to do that. Maybe just send me an email if you want um, to let me know. But in any case, you know, the classrooms are open and I'm out here if anyone wants to do it. Not that they have to or not that I'm suggesting it, but it is optional. Um, okay, so let's just continue through the um, notes on epistemology. We were making some good progress last time. So I'll just do a quick recap of that stuff and then we will try to press on into the material from there. So um, we've reached the point in the semester where we're all discussing the concept of epistemology. And epistemology is sometimes known as the theory of knowledge or the study of knowledge. What is knowledge? How do we get it? What are the criteria for having it? What is the difference between really knowing and just guessing and stuff like that? So this is actually a deep and complex issue that has been studied and discussed for thousands of years. It traces us all the way back to the works of the ancient Greek philosophers in the cradle of Western civilization 2,400 years ago in Athens, Greece. So I talked to you guys a little bit about life and times of um, Socrates and to some extent Plato, his student. Um, I'm not going to run through all the details again, but basically what I told you is that Socrates was this pretty brilliant and witty um, orator and conversationalist who would engage people in discussion and debate from all different walks of life. And that was cool and inspiring to many people, including a group of young men that followed him and listened to him teach and speak. But to some folks, it was considered subversive or somehow threatening to um, good order. And uh, the, uh, the claim was that he was corrupting these youth a little bit somehow by opening their minds. So the Athenian government said he has to stop doing philosophy or they'll prosecute him. He didn't stop, so they did put charges on him. He was found guilty in court uh, of corrupting the youth, I guess. So he was executed basically, even though they did come to try and um, escape him out of there. He refused to leave just on the principle that he loves Athens and that he doesn't want to be remembered as a fugitive or an anarchist or something. So he just took the penalty. Then Plato continues to carry the torch on and so on and so forth. Now, uh, after we talked about those brief historical uh, facts about Socrates' life, I started to open up the epistemology vocabulary discussion for all of us. And we talked about some basic concepts that I'll just quickly run through again here. First, we mentioned the concept of proposition. Okay, Proposition is a term which refers to the meaning of a sentence, not to be confused with the sentence itself. Because in some cases, we can have more than one sentence, but both, or however many of them, convey the same propositional content. In one example I showed you on the board, two sentences, the snow is white versus der Schnee ist weiss. And um, the snow is white is the English version of what we would say in German, der Schnee ist weiss. But these two propositions, sorry, these two sentences have the same content and therefore they are the same proposition. They convey the same meaning, they mean the same thing. So proposition, we start with that because propositions are the things that we either have knowledge of or don't propositional content. Okay, from there we talked about the word truth. What does it mean for a proposition to be true? As we discussed previously, to have a true proposition is to mean that whatever the proposition says matches the facts of reality. So like if I told you that I was wearing glasses right now, that's, um, that's a true proposition because it's not just a saying, it's something that's real, as you can tell. If I told you that I'm currently wearing a mask, as you can see, I'm not wearing a mask. So that would be a false proposition. So the proposition, we compare what it says to the facts of objective reality, and when whatever it says is what's happening, then that's a true statement. Okay, next we talked about what's a belief. Belief is simply when an individual thinks that a proposition is true. So, you know, like, um, suppose there's two people that disagree about some statement. Maybe one person thinks that um, 
Jones is the killer. And the other person says, no, I don't think, I don't think Jones is the killer. Taking the statement, Jones is the killer, one person thinks it's true, that that it corresponds to reality. The other person thinks that's not what really happened, and that's a statement, but it doesn't match the facts. So beliefs, we can divide over those beliefs and have different ones, but there's still just one objective set of facts. We hope to have beliefs that are true, but we, you know, for the most part, we just do our best. Then we talked, I guess, about justification. Anybody remember what that one meant? Just asking a quick question to touch base with you guys. What's justification again, anyone? Um, I think that was our last vocabulary term that we closed with. So it would be probably at the tail end of your last notes from the Monday meeting. Someone will let me know. Justification, having justification for a belief. Very good, Alex, yeah. So that's just having good reasons or evidence to support the belief instead of having just no uh, basis to, to judge the question. So if I thought that um, Jones is the killer, right, maybe the reason that I think that is because a lot of evidence exists. Like, for example, he had a motive and he purchased a weapon that matches the weapon used in the case given. And uh, maybe we've also found forensic evidence at the crime scene. You know, that's a case of a crime. Evidence is not only related to such contexts, but it's one that I think is easy for us to refer to because we've all heard of, you know, the concept of court cases and trials. Um, so whether it's in everyday life, in court, or anything else, justification is having good evidence or reasons to support what you think is true. Um, assumptions, do they fit in the terminology? Well, I guess assumptions would be beliefs, um, Stephen, and that's in the terminology. But an assumption, I guess, is a specific type of belief. It's a belief that's not justified by evidence. So your terminology of assumption, I think, would just be converted into um, I don't know, unjustified beliefs. Or if you think that assumptions are sometimes rational, then maybe you'd be able to say something about like inductively based assumptions, like uh, it's the sun has always come up before, so therefore the sun will come up tomorrow. I guess I'm assuming that the pattern uh, observed in the past will persist into the future. That gets us into complex questions of how we could justify it, the process of reasoning inductively, like reasoning from the past to the future. Um, but all that aside, yeah, assumptions are basically beliefs that some people believe assumptions are unjustified. So in that case, I would say they're unjustified beliefs. Other people believe that assumptions are based on patterns that we've assessed throughout the past. In that case, they may be justified on the basis of what's called induction. But anyway, okay, let's continue from there. I have one more vocabulary term to just kind of complete that part of the uh, epistemology lesson. And so I'll put that here on the board. So <clears throat> one more term is uh, epistemic agent. Now, what is an epistemic agent? Well, this is pretty easy to understand, I think. It's just a any type of being that is capable of having beliefs or knowledge. So a being that is capable, at least, of having beliefs or knowledge. Being that's capable of having beliefs, sorry, or knowledge. Letter F, thank you. Okay, so um, epistemic agent, something that just is able to have beliefs in the first place or have knowledge. Now, um, I'll ask what I hope is a very obvious question, but, but you know, give me the obvious answer, okay? So look at the expo marker you see that I'm writing notes with on the board and stuff. What do you think if I ask you this, yes or no? Is this an epistemic agent? This thing, this guy right here, the expo marker in my hand. Is this, as you see defined on the board, is this a being that is capable of having either beliefs or having knowledge? Yay, nay, what do you think? The marker. It's not. Okay, good. Clear. I hope it's very obvious. Now, you know it's obvious, and I don't want to belabor the point, but let me just stick with it for just one second longer if you'll humor me. Tell me what you think is the obvious reason that this is not an epistemic agent, the marker. I mean, you say no. We all agree, but could you just give a further little slight detail as to what your basis is? Why say it's not an epistemic agent? It's clear enough, but you can tell me. <clears throat> not a living being? Okay, very good, Alex. Yeah, I mean, for the most part, that's what I was thinking anyone would say. This is not a living thing. To have consciousness, to have the ability to perceive things, therefore to be able to form beliefs or have knowledge, you have to at least have sentience, right, as you're saying, Grant. You have to have, you know the ability to perceive. So you'd have to have a central nervous system, some type of sense organs, 
okay, so this is not it. This is an inanimate object. It doesn't perceive, judge, you know, observe or anything else. It's just a thing. It's an object, not a subject. But then on the other hand, okay, another perhaps very easy question. Uh, you and I, are we the epistemic agents based on the definition here and your own common sense? Would you say that uh, unlike the marker that I gave as the first example, that we are in fact epistemic agents? What do you think on this? Sure, yes, of course, right? I mean, that's clear. That's why we study epistemology, because we are things that do sometimes have knowledge. Now, human knowledge can be very, very specific, very detailed, quite interesting. Think of some of the things that you know. You know facts about history, like, I don't know, when the Declaration of Independence was signed, or um, the facts about the American Revolution, or when Columbus sailed to the West, or whatever. You know facts about astronomy, like we're the third planet from the sun, or you know that the moon orbits the Earth, or you know that, for example, I don't know, the facts about the periodic table of elements and the atomic weight of specific um, elements. Anyway, we know all kinds of things, and that's just scratching the surface. I mean, I, we could go on and on. Um, so we're very interesting things, I, I would say, as epistemic agents. If you really kind of take a third-person point of view on the universe, which is hard, right, because we just usually think from our own first-person perspective, but if you were to just sort of examine the question, how many things in this physical universe are epistemic agents, you know, the ratio is quite low, isn't it? I mean, it's mostly just matter and mass. You know, you've got stars, planets, comets, asteroids out there, black holes. But most everything out there is not thinking, feeling, judging, or having any experience at all. So if you really think about it, it's quite fascinating and um, special, isn't it, to be a human being, something that's not just an object, but capable of perceiving and experiencing the things that they're surrounded by and having knowledge and beliefs. Let me ask one last question before I move off of this. Do you think there could be any non-human epistemic agents at all? I mean, you've said that we are epistemic agents, agreed. Do you think there could be any other such things that are epistemic agents but not human beings? If so, why, why not? What could they be? Any thoughts or beliefs on this? <clears throat> Ryan, you're saying the, your answer is no. So for you, um, I mean, that's a pretty bold answer. I would have thought that you would at least consider uh, the non-human animals and stuff, right? Because... Sure, they don't have the kind of knowledge that we have, like they don't know that, they're the, that we're the, on the third planet from the sun, or they don't know facts about history and stuff. But don't you think that perhaps animals at least know, like when there's threats, or when there's food, or, you know, when there's something that they need to um, be fearful of, or attracted towards, you know, like, I mean, even my own pets, I think they know basic things, like when I'm going to um, feed them, or, you know, when there's loud noise that they should get away from. So anyway, I was only raising the point just because um, there could be some lower forms of life that also have knowledge and beliefs, just not on the same level or depth as us. Even little, uh, you know, ants and stuff and honeybees, it seems like they know certain things like how to collect and organize, mate, uh, find sustenance. So anyway, just throwing that out there. And Ryan, you raised another very interesting question, ro robots. Um, some people don't agree on the question whether robotic artificial intelligence is real knowledge or belief, if it's just sort of the simulation of a cognitive system that a human being or another animal could have. Uh, so that's kind of a deep question, which we'll actually get to um, a little bit later. Are little cells epistemic agents? Now, that's also a tough question, Connor. Um, I feel like if you go far enough down on the phylogenetic tree of life and you get down to like amoeba and bacteria and stuff, it's hard to describe them as having any kind of basic knowledge. But nonetheless, they do perpetuate and pass on their genetic information. So perhaps in some very, very basic fundamental sense. Uh, but anyway, guys, okay. So now with all these pieces in place, we can kind of combine them to learn about what the Greek definition of knowledge actually is. Okay, so here we go. What was knowledge according to these Greeks? And then not just the Greeks, but really to the whole West, this concept of knowledge remained the dominant theoretical interpretation of it for 2000 plus years. So knowledge, they say, is just this. A three-part definition. Knowledge is justified true belief. Justified true belief, knowledge. Um, sometimes in epistemology, people that are like in the field and that think a lot about this stuff, they use the abbreviation of knowledge, standing for K, equals JTB. So just the acronym, JTB, for justified true belief. 
Okay, so the basic idea here is that when someone has knowledge, three things have to be all there. First of all, they have to think something's true, meaning they believe it. If you don't think something's true, then of course, whether it's true or not, you disqualify yourself from having knowledge of it. That would be like um, taking a test and um, filling in the wrong answer on a specific multiple choice question. You wouldn't get you wouldn't get credit for knowing the answer, right? Because you didn't believe in the right answer. So first of all, you have to believe something, but not only that, it has to be a true belief, okay? Meaning that it has to be correct. So a false belief cannot be knowledge. We can have false beliefs for sure, but those things are not knowledge. So like, again, um, if you were taking a multiple choice test, suppose that it says, when did Columbus sail to America? And it gave you four options, A, B, C, D. And here are the dates listed for each option. A, 1492, B, 1692, C, 1892, D, 2030. So you're the student and you're like, okay, I can rule out D because in a history class, the date can't be in the future because it hasn't happened yet. Um, so it's got to be A, B, or C, but I'm totally not, I have no knowledge of dates. I didn't study, so I, I have to just guess B. So the student fills in B, 1692. Now question, guys, did that student know the answer to the question? Did the student have knowledge when they filled this in? No, because they failed various criteria here. First of all, they didn't believe the true answer, and the answer that they did believe was false. So I'm trying to just give you an intuitive example here as to why these criteria are specified. Common sense tells you that no one gets credit for knowing something when they provide a false answer. So if truth was not a necessary condition of knowledge, then the professor receiving this submission would just look at it and say, well, yeah, the answer was false, but it's still knowledge because knowledge doesn't matter. It could be true, false. It's, it's both. That's obviously not the case. Knowledge requires correctness. It requires accuracy. So two things at a minimum have to be there. You have to think something's true, but by the way, it actually is. So you have to like give the right answer as it were. I know that we're not always taking tests and quizzes in everyday life, but in the same sense, if you believe that the earth is flat, you don't know that the earth is flat because it is round, okay? So like when you have a belief that's just out of order with the facts, it's not even eligible to be knowledge. That would be like saying that you could know that I, Dr. Vulich, am 10 feet tall. Nobody could ever know that. Why not? Let me ask that so that I make sure that this is coming through. In response to my last example, I say the statement, the proposition, Dr. Vulich is 10 feet tall. Now, why do you think I'm telling you that no one could ever have knowledge of that? That's not possible for somebody to know about me. Why not? Because it's simply not true. Exactly, Drew. That's correct. It's not true. It's a false statement. So it's not possible to know that. Now, here, based on the terminology, the vocabulary that we've learned a little bit, um, maybe no one could, of course, no one could know that I'm 10 feet tall because no, I'm not. And neither is anyone else. In fact, I, you know, little obscure fact, perhaps, but um, uh, who was it? Robert Wadlow. He was eight, eight foot 11 back in like 100 years ago. He's the world record holder that we know of. But anyway, no one's ever been 10 feet tall. And neither am I, of course. So it's a false statement. Therefore, it can't be knowledge. But somebody could not know this statement. But what? If they were, I mean, they would have to be really way off base with their judgment. Maybe they'd be on drugs or going through, you know, hallucinations kind of mental illness, I don't know. But no one could ever know this about me because it's simply false. But maybe a very, very way out there person could what? Regarding the statement that I am 10 feet tall. Just seeing if you could uh, give me that. Yeah, so correct, Drew. Someone might believe it. Someone, I guess, could believe that if they were completely confused or hallucinating, seeing things, and then they might think, oh, wow, it looks like this. But no one can know something false. They could believe something false. Beliefs have the capacity of being wrong as you guys know, when you get a wrong answer on a test. But knowledge has to be true and correct. Otherwise, it doesn't get checked off as the right answer. Okay, so um, one more thing, though. Even if you have a true belief, that's two out of three, but it's still not enough. You have to have all three of these conditions. So like, here, I'll give you an example. Another one involving a multiple choice test, and then I'll vary the case a little bit, okay? Take that multiple choice exam again, the ca case I gave before, where we have A, B, C, and D, and the listed responses are, 1492, 1692, 1892, 2030 for the date of Columbus sailing to the New World. So we've eliminated D. Take the student now that doesn't know the answer, okay? So they're like, I don't have any knowledge of when it is. I just know it's got to be A, B, or C. I'm going to just totally guess. 14 is my lucky number. That was like a, my best year in high school when I was 14, freshman year. So I'm going to fill in A. Now, did that student get the correct answer when they filled in A as 1492? Yes, it was the right answer. But did the student really know 
what they were saying? Did they really know that Columbus sailed in 1492 if they had to end up guessing? Well, they were lucky with their guess, sure. But why, why would you say it's not knowledge? Which condition is off or not satisfied in this current example? The thing that's blocking it from being a real authentic case of knowing the answer. What's missing in this version? <clears throat> what do you think on that? Because we told you that this student gives the correct response. They fill in the correct bubble. But when they did it, they were guessing. And they had no you know, ability to tell you why that was the right answer. So in this example I'm giving you, the missing condition of knowledge is which one? Didn't have reasons to be sure it was the right answer. That is correct, Stephen, yes. Didn't have any justification. So it's a lucky guess, but it's not knowledge. In the same sense, guys, right? I could be sitting here today and a fan of science fiction, as I kind of am, and I could say, based on my love of science fiction, I want to believe that there's extraterrestrial life in the universe. Now, could I be correct? I would say it's a possibility, at least, of course, because here we are, you know. But um, do I know that there's extraterrestrial life out there? Even if I'm right in guessing right now, I don't think I have knowledge. For me to know, I would have to have better evidence. Um, and then it would be taken outside the realm of speculation. So like if the Mars rover starts beaming back, you know, clear signs that there's some type of life on the surface of Mars or whatever, then after that evidence came in, I could now say, well, I, have no, I know there's life in outer space because it's somehow been proven. But I'm not in position to claim that as knowledge in the absence of justification. Um, in the same way, you know, I could, I could guess right now that there's an even number of citizens in the state of California, but I haven't looked up the census numbers. So if I'm right, it's only because there's a 50-50 chance that an even number will be the number since every integer is either divisible by two or it isn't. Uh, so, you know, I've got a 50-50 chance of being correct in this random guess that there's an even number of Californians, but I don't know it unless I actually look at the data and then after having examined it, if that's what the data shows, then I would say I actually know that thing. Okay, so hopefully this picture is coming to focus for you guys. I'm just trying to stimulate it by means of a few different examples and some common sense reasoning. For you to have knowledge then, as I would repeat, you have to think something's true, believe it, but it also has to be true, so it is correct, and then you have to have justification. Um, if even one of the three conditions is missing, so like you believe something and you have very good evidence, but it's false, that would not be knowledge. Like, so take the case where someone was framed for a crime they didn't commit. Um, I'm not saying that typically happens, but maybe it has happened, I'm sure it has. In case that it happened, the evidence would indicate that the person was guilty, but it would be misleading evidence. Now, usually evidence leads us to the correct conclusions, but not 100% of times. So it's possible to have a true, sorry, a, a justified belief that's false. It's also possible to have a true belief that's not justified. So we are only having knowledge when all three can be found in one case. Justification, truth, and belief. So they say of this definition of knowledge that the three conditions are individually necessary and jointly sufficient. What that means is that each condition by itself, considered alone, is needed for knowledge. But no single one, or even two out of three, is enough um, for knowledge without all three being present. So like, each one of the three is required, but none of them by themselves alone would be enough without the others to complement it. So let me give you a metaphor to help somehow process that a little. Take this as an example that Suppose to bake a cake, you had to have three main ingredients, flour, sugar, and water. Now, I know in reality, probably you would have to have a few more things than that. But let's just pretend that those are the three necessary and sufficient ingredients for cake. Now, is water necessary in that example? Yes. You know, you need it. But if only water is what you have, is that enough to form the cake? No, it's just a bucket of water sitting there, and it won't become a cake unless it has the other ingredients to add to it. Same with the other example of um, sugar and you know, flour. Those things are needed, but they're not enough unless you combine the other ingredients. So think of these things, I guess, as like the three ingredients that bake the cake of knowledge, okay? So like you need that truth, justification, and belief, but by itself or even with just two of those parts, they won't form knowledge, um, so they all have to be combined, and then they're jointly sufficient. Now, with that discussion in place, I'm ready to just read to you the brief dialogue that we have from Plato, where this is all discussed. So in Plato's dialogue called the Mino, um, he recognizes that true belief is not enough uh, for knowledge without justification. And he therefore argues that justified true belief is the correct account of knowledge. So this is a classic definition. Um, 
It holds that these three conditions are each needed and only sufficient in combination. And it dominated the landscape of thinking on the topic for thousands of years until 1963. And we'll get to the work of Gettier in a moment. But okay, here's the dialogue. And I'm just going to read most of it to you. Very short, so I can manage to do that while we're all here together. The dialogue is a discussion between two people, Socrates, the great you know, teacher of Plato, and then this Greek general named Mino. Okay, so Socrates and Mino are going back and forth. And here's what Socrates says to start it off. So he says, Mino, a man who knew the way to Larissa or anywhere else you like and went there and guided others would surely lead them well and correctly? Question mark. Mino says, certainly, Socrates. Okay, so I'm going to explain each little passage as we go through it step by step. So in this first portion, Socrates asks this question to his friend Mino. He says, suppose someone knows how to get to Larissa and... They've done it many times, so they know how to get there. Couldn't they lead other people there? And he says, yeah, sure. So here's the, the city that he's referring to. I'm just going to write it on the board one time if I can. Okay. Larissa. Only thing I'm telling you about Larissa is that it's just another city in um, Greece. Okay. And it's like about 100 miles uh, from Athens where Socrates lived. And that's also where Mino was born. So that's why Socrates kind of refers that to him because he knows the location. So all he's saying is this, suppose someone knows how to get to Larissa from Athens because they're talking in Athens. So he says, suppose that 100 mile journey over to Larissa, someone knows how to make the journey and they've completed it many times successfully. So it's like they know by like the back of their hand as some say the route to get to Larissa. Couldn't that person based on their knowledge lead other people that had never been there before correctly to the destination? And of course, Mino says, sure, yes, of course, certainly. Now, to make that question relatable to you, you know, when we used to all be in the face-to-face -face setting, um, we'd be in the same classroom. And so I would say to students here in this classroom, you guys know how to get to wherever you stay at night, right, from here, your dorm room or your apartment, wherever you're staying or, your, you know, your family house, if that's where you're still living. And, you know, students will, like, of course, nod, you know, because, of course, if you're in the classroom, you must know how to get home from there. I'd be a sad person that says, I don't actually know how to reach back to my house. So now we're not all face-to-face, -face, of course. But can you guys give yourselves a similar example? Like take Chapman University. I'm assuming probably most of you have at least visited the campus. So if you know how to get to Chapman, don't you think that you could successfully lead someone there who's never been there before, right? Like, hey, you want to check out this college that I'm attending? Um, come with me and I'll take you over there and show you how to get there because I've been there many times. So I don't want to overcomplicate it much, but that's the first thing. Socrates asks Mino, if someone knew how to get to Larissa, couldn't they lead others based on the knowledge and they would get them there correctly? And he says, yes. Makes sense? Let me know in the chat if it does. And as you, you know, start typing that out, I'll continue from there. So, okay, next thing, Socrates continues. He says, all right, Mino. Well, how about this, though? What if someone had had a correct opinion as to which was the way, but had not gone there, nor had knowledge of it? Wouldn't he also lead correctly? And again, Mino says, certainly, Socrates. So now this is a slightly different question. What he's asking him now is this. He says, okay, well, what if someone actually didn't really know how to get there, but they did have a correct opinion? Now, let me explain about the, word, cor the words correct opinion, what he means on that. So correct opinion refers to two out of the three parts of our definition of knowledge here. And just thinking about our English language, right, maybe you can convert the two pieces here into the two parts of knowledge that you see above. So correct opinion is what two out of those three criteria without the third one? Correct opinion represents blank blank. What two pieces of knowledge? Okay, very good. Yes, Stephen. True belief, but without, without justification. Okay, so let me put that here. Correct opinion, a true belief without justification. True belief that's not justified. So correct, correct refers to being true. It's correct. It's right. It's, it's accurate. Opinion. Opinion is what you think. So that's your belief. So a correct opinion is a true belief, but it's distinguished in this conversation between knowledge and correct opinion. So knowledge is the full thing with all three criteria, and correct opinion is just those two out of three. So what he says now to, to Mino, rather, sorry, is this. 
Mino, you, you answer my first question. If someone knew how to get there, couldn't they lead someone? And he says, boom, of course, yes, they could do that. Think of you being able to lead someone like, you know, to a location that you know of that they haven't been to. You meet, you meet a new friend, you know, a classmate in college, and you're like, let's chill like, at my pad for a while and hang out, play video games or something. I'll lead you there. You could do it. But second question is this. Suppose that someone has never gone, so they don't know the way. They do not know the way. They've never done it once. But they do have a correct opinion as to how to get there. Couldn't they lead someone using just the correct opinion, even if it's not knowledge? And again, Mino says yes. Now, um, here's kind of what I want you to think about maybe as an example to, to make this even more relatable. Um, so in our world, in our modern world, a lot of times we know how to get to places by heart, right? You've done it many times, so you don't need any kind of like help getting there. You could just do it um, easily because you've done it so many times in the past. But sometimes we don't know how to get to a place and we're going there the first time ever, but we can still get there because even though we don't have our own knowledge, we oftentimes use uh, some type of assistance to make sure we securely get there uh, you know, in the correct way. So who can think of an example of what I'm referring to, like how you might be able to find a destination without actually knowing the way you're by heart yourself? What do you think I'm sort of speaking on here? What's the modern day method? Yeah, so GPS navigation systems. We have you know global satellites orbiting the big round Earth, of course. Um, and those things give us information that we could use to chart our course as we travel around and drive and stuff. Okay, so Google Maps and Waze and those kind of things, correct. So think about Socrates' second question kind of like this. He says to Mino, suppose someone's never gone to that city of Larissa, but they have like a correct map. You know, that's the equivalent of the correct opinion. So it's a correct map. It works. It's accurate. But the thing is, since you've never made the trip yourself, you're not 100% sure whether it's correct or you don't have the confidence of past experience to fill in the total certainty that it is correct. But it is. It is nonetheless. So he says, if someone has never gone there, but they have the correct map instructions, basically, couldn't they use that to lead someone? And Mino again says yes. He says, yeah, that would also work. So now Socrates adds to it. He says, well, as long as he has the right opinion about that of which the other guy has knowledge, he will not be a worse guide than the one who knows, since he has a true opinion, even if it isn't knowledge. And Mino says, yes, in no way will it be worse. So what he's doing here is he's comparing the value of having the status of knowledge with having the status of just a correct opinion without justification. And so far, it just looks like he's trying to get Mino to agree that there's no additional benefit to having that knowledge. It's just as well to have a correct map. But he wants to probe that distinction a little bit further, and he wants to now lean in on that. Why would it be maybe better to have knowledge, though? Is there some additional advantage or benefit that comes from knowing it by heart as opposed to just relying on an accurate map? So he asks this. He says, so... Mino, correct opinion is no less useful than knowledge. And Mino says, yes, to this extent, Socrates. But, and now I'm going to pause for a minute while I give you a thought on this conversation. What would your answer be if I asked you like Socrates does? Is there any better value to having the knowledge of the route as opposed to having to rely on the map or the GPS? What would you say to that? Is there any reason why you'd prefer to know by heart? What, you know, additional utility does that give you? Like what's the benefit or the extra advantage, if any, of knowing how to get there? You say yes, Ellie, but I'm, I'm hoping you can give me a little bit of a, um, a reason. Why is it better to know? Why? Yet, well, you say you would trust it more. Okay, that's good, Stephen. You would trust it more um, because you'd have the confidence of your prior experience knowing that the instructions are right. Ryan, there is value to it because you don't need to rely on another resource. Yes, true. Um, but if the resource works just as well as the knowledge, I'm playing devil's advocate, then why wouldn't you rather just use the resource? Um, Ryan, you say for assistance. Oh, oh, because you don't need to rely on another resource for assistance. I get it. Connor, yes, an advantage is that I'm more confident. That's also fair. Eric, the speed at which you're able to provide information. Okay, and that's all good. Um, and you think the map could be wrong. But Ellie, one thing I have to make clear is that we, we stipulate by this example that the map is correct. It's just that you don't perhaps know that it's correct, having not yet used it yourself. Um, or your map could fail if you lose service. That's also a good point, Ellie. Now, let me, um, let me say something along those same lines, yeah? Um, 
what I would say, and this is kind of what Mino says next to Socrates. He says, well, think about it this way. If you have the map, even if it's a correct map, what happens if there's a point along your journey where you're not sure how to uh, coordinate what the map is saying with the environment that you're in? Like, what if there's a road sign that's been knocked over or, you know, like some kind of road closure that causes you to need to quickly reroute? Um, if you've gone on the journey yourself many times, then you're very well skilled in what all the alternative routes are. And also, you won't lose your way along the path by somehow becoming confused as to whether you should continue to trust the map or not. So basically, Mino thinks the same way. He says, it would be better to know because the person with knowledge will always get there because they have the knowledge. The person with the map, even though it's correct, will sometimes doubt its correctness and therefore not always make it uh, to their destination. So here's how that exchange goes. Socrates says, so correct opinion is no less useful than knowledge. Mino says, well, to this extent, Socrates, yes, but the man who has knowledge will always succeed, whereas he who has true opinion will only succeed at times. And Socrates kind of presses him on that a little. He says, well, how do you mean, though? Because won't he who has the right opinion always succeed as long as the opinion is right? And Mino starts to concede the point. He says, that does appear to be so of necessity. And it makes me wonder, Socrates, if that's the case. Why is knowledge prized more than right opinion? And why are they different? <clears throat> so now Socrates is ready to give him his own answer as to why knowledge has greater value. And so he says, okay, Mino, do you, do you know why you're wondering or should I tell you? Mino says, by all means, Socrates, just tell me. And so Socrates says, okay, it's because you have paid no attention to the statues of Daedalus, but perhaps there are none in Thessaly, where he was then living. Um, so he's talking here about a myth, a myth and a legend within the Greek culture of ancient Athens. He's talking to us about this sculptor named Daedalus. So let me talk to you about that a little bit. Here's the name, D-A-E-D-A-L-U-S, Daedalus. Now, um, just a quick little backstory, okay? Daedalus was a great Greek sculptor of Athens, and he was the most famous and well-known sculptor of the time, making these very impressive and amazing, realistic, human-like figures of clay or marble, whatever. And um, he got the reputation as being the most realistic sculptor, so here's what people started to think. If you ever acquired one of his priceless sculptures, then you should um, make sure to attach it to the ground securely with ropes because these statues, they thought, this is ancient Greece, right? They thought these statues were so realistic and so on that if you didn't fasten them to the ground by means of these ropes, then when everyone's asleep at night, these ultra realistic statues would probably just get up and what? What do you think is the finish line, the punchline to that uh, myth? They said, fasten them to the ground with ropes. The Daedalus statues are amazing and realistic. If you don't tie them to the ground with ropes, watch out, because what will happen is they will what? According to the myth, what do you think the myth said? What basis did it say to secure these statues with ropes? Because if not, then why not? Well, what would happen then? Yes, Stephen, that's right. The, the myth held that they were so realistic that they would just get up, turn to life, and run away from you. So if they're fastened down by ropes, then they stay on your property. So um, now he's using that as a bit of a metaphor. He says, you could have these statues with the ropes or without the ropes, but wouldn't you rather have it with ropes? Because it's the same beautiful statue, fair enough, either way. But what do the ropes do that makes it better to have the ropes? Well, it makes sure that it's not just here today, gone tomorrow, but that it will remain with you. So the ropes have the function of securing the beautiful statue so that you don't just have it for a little while, but that you retain it and keep it. Okay. Now let me read a little bit, and you'll see how this builds into a metaphor. He says, maybe you've paid no attention to the statues of Daudelie. Mino says, what do you mean when you say that? And he says, they too run away and escape if you do not tie them down but they remain in place if they are tied down. Mino says, so what? And then Socrates says this, to acquire an untied work of Daedalus is not worth much. It's like acquiring a runaway slave because it does not remain in place, but it is worth much if it is tied down because his works are very beautiful. What am I thinking of when I say this? True opinions, because true opinions, as long as they stay in place, are a fine thing and all they do is good, but they are not willing to remain for long and they will escape from a man's mind so that they are not worth much unless and until you tie them down by giving an account of the reason why. 
And that, Mino, my friend, is recollection as we previously agreed. After they are tied down, in the first place they become knowledge and they remain in place. That is why knowledge is prized higher than correct opinion, and knowledge differs from correct opinion because it is tied down. And then Mino says, yes, by Zeus, Socrates, it seems to be something like that. You know, by God, Socrates, it's something like that. Socrates closes by saying, indeed, I too speak as one who does not have knowledge but is guessing. However, I certainly do not think I am guessing that right opinion is different from knowledge. If I claim to know anything, and I would make that claim about very few things, I would put this down as one of the things that I do know. And Mino finishes by saying, rightly so, Socrates. So let me just quickly explain the last part there of the dialogue where we got to the ropes and stuff and the statues. What he's saying is these um, statues can be somewhat compared to the definition of knowledge. The ropes are analogous to justification, okay? So what is the statue without the ropes? The Daedalus statue with no ropes is like a true opinion without justification. Now, why would you like to have justification added to your true opinions? It's the same reason that you would like to have ropes added to these statues. Because with justification, your true opinion will be locked down into your mind and into your belief system. But without justification, you don't retain the information. Okay, let's go back to that student who had the lucky guess on the multiple choice exam, having to just guess the date that Columbus sailed over to the New World. If they guessed, then they didn't fill it out with confidence. And it was a correct guess, so that's nice. But tell me, until they someday learn the reasons why that's the right answer, if we asked them this question again in like a year, would they have remembered the answer? No. So what type of person will not just fill the bubble in right today, but tomorrow and for the rest of their life? The type of person who knows for sure why that is the correct answer, and they could justify that answer with detailed reasons. So to those of us that have true opinions, but no basis for those true opinions, without a basis, we will forget it or change our mind about it, and therefore it will escape from your mind. So justification has a function similar to the function of these ropes. The ropes secure the statues so they can't get away. Justification secures your correct opinions so that they are not forgotten or dismissed. Okay? So like I talked to you earlier about the belief that there's extraterrestrial life in outer space. Maybe today I believe that, but tomorrow, you know, I'm feeling a little more nihilistic and I'm like, no, you know, it's just a miracle there's even life on one planet. There's probably nothing out there. I might flip-flop on this back and forth. But what would cause me to stop changing my mind on it is if I received certain evidence that these aliens really did exist. At that point, I would no longer say, well, I can debate, you know, flip-flop, waffle back and forth on this. With evidence, it would remain something permanently clear to me, and I would no longer be changing my mind, and therefore I could retain the true belief. So does this help make some sense of the definition of knowledge? I hope, guys. What Plato's, sorry, Socrates, slash Plato, because he's Plato's the writer, Socrates is the teacher. What Socrates or Plato is saying here is that you'd be better off having knowledge than just having lucky guesses about stuff. Correct opinions are great when they're correct, but without that evidence or justification, it's not going to be held down in your mind. You'll just lose it. So knowledge, he is saying to me, you know, it is better than having a correct opinion. It is better to know the way to Larissa than to just have an accurate map. Because the accurate map, unless you actually internalize the steps and you know how it works, um, you're bound to get lost the next time you go because you still have some lack of trust in it. Once you have the knowledge, though, um, you make it correctly every time because the justification keeps the correct uh, opinion from changing or leaving your mind. Okay, guys, so justify true belief. That's what knowledge is, according to the Greeks. Sounds good, right? But the only problem is not so fast. Thousands of years passed, and then we all of a sudden fast forward to 2,000 years later, 1963, America, and there's this American author, Edmund Gettier, who wrote this powerful, very short essay, and it basically blew up this whole consensus view about knowledge. So ever since 1963, we're living in what we call the post-Gettier era, and since then, we're no longer so uh, completely sure that we have the right idea of knowledge, or at least we think that justified true belief is not completely it, like there's something extra that has to be added to this. Um, but the field has still not reached a consensus as to what the missing criteria might be. So in a way, that's a very odd and I would also argue um, almost kind of a spooky feeling because it's like we're at a point in history where we don't exactly know what knowledge is, theoretically. Um, 
And since knowledge lies right at the heart of so many basic important concepts, it's fundamentally disturbing, I think, to not have a clear sort of fix on what knowledge is. And there's also kind of like a meta uh, sort of oxymoron here. Like when we say we don't know what knowledge is, then I guess we don't know what we don't have when we say that we don't know it because knowledge is the concept being analyzed itself. But anyway, I digress. Let's talk then about Gettier's work and how it basically exposed some flaws in this classical definition. Um, <clears throat> so this part of our meeting, you know, talking about Gettier, it's going to roll into Friday. Um, I also have, I think, some video links that I'll share on that. So it's just going to take a little longer to finish Gettier, but we have time next week to, to get it all in also. So here's the guy's name, Edmund Gettier. Can somebody Google him? Because I think he's still alive, um, but I want to make sure I know that for sure. He was born in 1927, so he's getting quite old. Um, last I checked, he was still living. He was born on Halloween of 1927. Um, but yeah, so he taught philosophy at University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Um, and he's actually very interesting in philosophy because, okay, cool. Yeah, he is still alive, age 93, going very strong. So a lot of respect to, to Professor Gettier. Um, this paper that he wrote is called, Is Justified True Belief Knowledge? Is Justified True Belief Knowledge from 1963? Okay. Um, sorry for the glare. I just happen to keep writing right in the middle of it. But it says, Is Justified True Belief Knowledge? Question mark. Edmund Gettier, 1963. Um, so the title of the paper is a question. It, it's a question, Is this classical, well-received definition actually the right one? And essentially his answer in the end is going to be like, um, no, uh, or at least... Not completely. Um, with Gettier, his, uh, his biography is interesting in philosophy because he wrote this paper that's widely considered, you know, a revolutionary paper that really overturned thousands of years of consensus views about what knowledge is, what human knowledge is. But the paper itself is very brief. It's, it's literally just two pages, like one front and back page. And um, the other strange thing about it is it's the only thing he ever published, okay? Like, he's done a lot of work. He's taught a lot of people. He's supervised grad students. He's, you know, been a philosopher for a very long time. But in his whole long career, he just wrote and published this one little two-page article, which essentially uh, blows up the classical definition of knowledge. And then that was it. He never published anything else after that. It's kind of like the ultimate mic drop, if you will, you know, coming out being like, you guys don't know what knowledge is anymore. He doesn't solve the problem. He doesn't say, now here's what it is. He just shows us that the existing definition was deficient. And then, you know, he kind of like, that's it. That, that was his major contribution to the world and to the academy. But, uh, but it's a substantial one. So Edmund Gettier, American philosopher, is justified true belief knowledge. Okay, so to start off his paper, and again, like I told you, this has to continue on Friday, but that's fine. And to start his paper off, he just mentions a couple of preliminary points. One of those points is that it is possible to have a justified false belief, and that clearly is possible. Um, maybe this will be the last point that I'll be able to raise today, and we'll pick up here on Friday, but can anybody tell me an example of like either a real or possible case where someone could have a belief that's justified, fully justified, but it still was false? Like, Can you imagine a situation of getting misleading justification for something? making some evidence that makes it seem like something's true, but it actually wasn't in the end. Any possible example of that? Justified belief, but which was false. What kind of scenario or situation could, could involve such a thing as that? You know, I can think of a few just off the top of my head, but let's see here, Eric. You say thinking someone committed a crime based on the evidence. Right, well, Eric, to be fully specific, I think you mean like in a case where the person did not in fact commit the crime. So the evidence indicated their guilt, but they didn't really do it. Um, yes, so that's fine. I can imagine also like an even more simple case, like a surprise party. Um, people are trying not to let this person know that all his friends are gathering to surprise them on a party of like their birthday or something. So um, maybe like a close friend to them is just trying to get them to come to this house 
because they say, oh, I need you to pick up like, um, I, I need you to pick up this uh, pair of shoes that you left here or something. And then when they get there, like surprise, and all their friends had told them that no one was in town. So maybe they would have had evidence developed in the ruse uh, that was indicating the contrary of what they're actually seeing. And other examples too. I mean, little kids believing in Santa Claus, maybe they have the evidence because their parents are telling them that and they see Santa at the mall and stuff, but there's no such thing. So anyway, most of the time justified beliefs are true. That's why we want justification, but there are some possible scenarios where we could have a justified but false belief. Okay, so we'll pick up from here on Friday. Let me just say this. I think I'll be done with all the uh, midterm grading today. So my plan is to send out the notification tomorrow in the morning or so. Uh, and then from there, everyone can, whoever wants to get their grade can simply email me and I'll be responding to those emails throughout the weekend to get people their grade with their comments. So, you know, class keeps moving forward, um, but we're doing pretty well, I think. So anyway, guys, is everything good? Let me know in the chat. If so, I'll let us go for today and just be alert for my um, notification I'll send out um, tomorrow. Okay, yeah, thanks, Ryan. And, you know, I don't know if there are any students that are ever going to try and attend these meetings. It's totally okay if you don't, but just know that if you do, obviously you have to do like a few basic things, like I think get the COVID test. Um, and then also, um, what is it? Take the daily health screening th that they send you as an email. And, um, and of course, wear a mask all the time. But anyway, guys, okay, perfect. Thanks again, and um, have a good one. I'll be in touch, and I'll see you guys soon. Okay, bye-bye. <clears throat> thanks again. Thank you, Connor. And thanks, everyone else. Bye-bye.